case, leases the brakes to the airline. And so it's, it's a great symbiotic relationship. Um, Honeywell has an incentive to develop brakes that last longer because Honeywell has to replace the brakes. If a mechanic comes to Honeywell and says, we need to replace the brakes, Honeywell has to pay for the new brakes on the airline. But the airline has fixed costs. They know exactly how much they spend on brakes for every landing. Okay? So Honeywell has fixed costs. Their accountants are happy. They can calculate what their profit should be. Um, not Honeywell, but American Airlines, whoever the airline is. And then Honeywell has an incentive to make a longer, longer lasting brake. And the mechanics don't care about the cost of replacing the brakes because it doesn't cost their employer anything for them to decide, I need to replace the brakes. Okay? It just takes time. Okay, but the, the cost of the brakes is borne by the manufacturer. Um, the airlines also do that. Um, they, uh, for example, airlines now lease the engines on the, on the aircraft. They call it power by the hour. And the airline knows that for every hour that engine is operating, and you have to keep a log of every minute the engine is operating, they have to pay so much money to the, uh, the owner of the engines. And the owner of the engines could be General Electric, it could be uh, chrome alloy gas turbines, it could be a number of people. They're responsible for maintaining that engine, repairing that engine, and they lease it back to the airlines. Well, the same thing most of the aircraft you're flying on are owned by some big investment company. American Airlines typically doesn't own that aircraft. They're leasing it. They pay a certain amount per month or per hour or whatever for the engines to one company, for the airframe to another company, uh, for the brakes to another company, and it actually is, is not a bad system. It's sort of like Zipcar, right? You're renting the car, right? So anyway. That wasn't what today's lecture was going to be about, but I, I appreciate the, the digression. And what's your, Matt, right? Jordan. Jordan, 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 Jordan Charles. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, so Jordan's going to give a talk on why everything I said about $2 a pound savings is wrong for the BMW, right? For electric vehicles. Electric, for electric vehicles. And how they changed the rules because of different constraints, okay? And I'm just glad that I talked about collateral weight savings because that's his story is basically about collateral weight savings on batteries, right? So I just stole your thunder. Okay. But it's a great presentation, I thought. In fact, I was going to tell you, you ought to think about writing a paper on it. Uh, seriously. You know, I haven't thought about exactly where you publish it, but it's an interesting story. And you certainly have quantified it more than the Wall Street Journal would quantify it, okay? Um, and there's nothing wrong with having assumptions as long as you state what your assumptions are in a paper. Um, many people don't bother to state their assumptions, and then, <clears throat> then you run into problems. Um, okay, anybody have any questions before we get, begin? So the last time, and I couldn't really think of a summary of last time, it was sort of a recitation on competition among materials for water transport and then gas transport. And I actually showed... Uh, this, but it was the end of the end of the hour, and I didn't pass it around. This is a piece of corrugated stainless steel tubing. There is about six billion feet of this in the United States, uh, through most people's home, many people's homes, and the newer homes, and as a replacement in older homes. Um, it's got polyethylene. This particular product has polyethylene uh, yellow plastic. Uh, it's not really for. It's not supposed to be for insulation. It's the yellow is supposed to identify it for uh, gas piping. There's another company that makes little connectors like this for 40 or 50 years, and they paint it yellow. Okay, this actually has a, um, uh, a, um, a tube around a tube of plastic around it, and it's plastic has low coefficient of friction. You can pull this through the walls. Okay, and the corrugations don't get stuck on the corners as you drill a hole through a 2 by 4 or through a steel I-beam or something. So it does have a function other than just provide color. It does also provide electrical insulation, so you know, hopefully you don't short out to it and arc to it uh, from your household wiring. But in fact, if you have a small manufacturing flaw that you could never even see even under a microscope, um, if you have a very high voltage discharge in this particular one, uh, 
actually, we actually probably put a little copper wire through here. Uh, but uh, there's a very small hole, and the electricity went through that small hole, and you can't see it here. I'll pass it around. Created a, a hole about 10 times the diameter in the steel underneath. The electricity doesn't attack the the, co the uh, plastic, but it doesn't take a very big hole for all those electrons to get through the plastic. But once it hits the steel, it melts it. Okay. This also occurs on aircraft wings. If you paint an aircraft and lightning hits the aircraft, the paint can actually focus the lightning energy and can it can take 10% of the energy of lightning stroke to perforate the wing on an aircraft. What's the problem of perforating a wing on an aircraft? Fuel. Your aircraft wing is actually your fuel container. Okay? It's your structural wing for support, but it also contains fuel. So they do lots of tests at Boeing and other places. In fact, I had a student do an internship at Boeing, and she was working on lightning strikes to... Uh, aircraft wings, uh, although she was doing composites. They already know a lot about what happens when you hit an aluminum wing uh, that's bare or a painted aluminum wing. If it's painted and the two things are different, just putting a coat of paint on it makes a big difference in how the la lightning attacks it. But she was working on composites because Boeing wants to use more and more composites to make lighter and lighter weight vehicles. Okay. Uh, so anyway, we were talking about some of the competition among materials for different things. And I'm going to change course a little bit and get more into structural material design. And I already pointed out, Ashby wrote this, wrote a number of books. Um, one is Material Selection and Mechanical Design, and I've showed you the little pamphlet. And in that, he has a lot of these, what are now known as Ashby plots because he was the first person to kind of do these. And what did I do? I'm not going to be able to. <coughs> I hit something wrong, and I'll never be able to find out how to get to. Well, I hate to do this. I think the only way to do this is to turn this off and turn it back on to get me back to the home page that allows me to expand and contract things. In any case, Ashby has a whole series of these plots that basically um, uh, plot two material properties against one another. <clears throat> In this case, he's plotting... Someday I'll read the controls on this again, figure out how it works. Um, I did it actually twice, but nothing's very simple anymore. I like the days when we just had little mechanical switches I could figure out. Anyway, he's plotting Young's modulus versus density, and it turns out E over rho, Young's modulus, divided by the density, shows up in a lot of mechanical property formulas. And in fact, if you look at the page before this in his book, under material selection, Young's modulus E versus against density rho, E over rho equal to some constant will be minimum weight design for stiff ties. A stiff tie being something like if I, anybody know what the hammer throw is in sports where you have this steel ball and it's connected to a, to a, a rope or something and, and you, uh, it's the hammer throw, I guess they call it the hammer throw. And the guy picks it up and he swings it around and he sees, he lets it go in centrifugal force, sees how, throw, how far he can throw the, the steel ball, which is a 16 pound ball or something. In any case, um, that tie has a certain tension in it and the strength of that for stiff ties, the string that's holding the ball to the handle that he's got holding on with his hand, Minimum deflection in centrifugal loading, as an example. E to the one-half, which you can't quite see, E to the one-half over rho is minimum weight for stiff beams. So if I was looking at, I have two <coughs> rulers here I had in my office, actually in my briefcase. This is a very thin plastic beam. This is a 
Also a thin beam, actually same size ruler, but this one's got a magnetic stripe on it. It's a lot heavier, and you can see this one sinks under its own weight, okay? Like a diving board, this one's stiffer. Even though it's thinner, it's a different plastic, this one is heavier, uh, basically. And so you can have stiffness. You can get stiffness from two different um, uh, properties of a material. One is Young's modulus, which is a property of the material. It's related to that Leonard Jones potential and the bonding between the atoms and how strong that bonding is. The Young's modulus is the second derivative of that energy potential minimum. Okay, so the steeper that is, and the highest Young's modulus for any material is carbon. Tungsten's not far behind. That steepness of the Leonard Jones potential. This is energy of bonding versus distance radius between the two atoms. And the steeper it is, the sharper this curvature, the higher the melting point, and the melting point is basically related to the depth of that energy potential well, and the stiffness, the Young's modulus, is proportional to the curvature, sharpness of the curvature. Tungsten and carbon, carbon being diamond, um, are the two two of the stiffest materials we have. There are limits to that, but in fact, you can either get stiffness from a material property, and there's one other way to get stiffness. What's that? Pardon me? Design. Thickness, Thickness design, cross-section, you name it, geometry, okay? It turns out, for equal areas, what would be stiffer, a solid rod, or a tube of equal area. Well, this one's stiffer, okay? A tubular section is stiffer than equal weight, equal material of a solid rod. So you can get stiffness from two things, okay? And so what this plot shows you, uh, Ashby plot will give you is E over rho for tens tensile stiffness, so you don't get um, uh, the, if you swing the rubber band around, or the ball around on a steel rope, you will get less stretch than if it's on a rubber rope, okay? Because Young's modulus is larger. E to the one half is minimum design for beams, like I talked about there. E to the one third over rho is for plates, okay? Um, you know, you can talk about a piece of paper. How stiff is that sheet? compared to some other, a sheet of some other material. These are not the same thickness. This one actually is flimsier. That rubber is flimsier than the paper. The paper actually has a higher stiffness. So if you go to this, Ashby will have all of these on one plot. The advantage of an Ashby plot is you can see all kinds of properties on one plot for any two properties plotted against another. Young's modulus, and you see here, Guidelines for minimum weight design, E over rho, E over, e over rho to the first power, E over rho to the one half, E over rho to the one third, and they have different slopes. And you can compare those slopes, and the slopes he's put in here are ISO, E over rho to the first power, and that's 10 to the fourth, okay? And that actually has units of meters per second. Does anyone know what E over rho being meters per second. What type of test in the mechanical behavior laboratory that uh, that's used for? You've you've heard of stress strain curves, right? Um, and your so you've got a stress strain curve, and they tell you that that's that's Young's modulus is the slope of the elastic region, and then you have the plastic region. And they if you took a class, how many people took a a class in high school or as a sophomore in mechanical behavior or whatever, and they told you to calculate Young's modulus from the stress strain curve, right? It's not the way you do it in the real world. In the real world, you actually measure, you put a vibrational frequency in a rod and you measure the speed of sound in meters per second. And from that, you get a much more accurate Young's modulus. This Young's modulus, when you're just trying to do a tensile test, it's easy to show the students. 
a principle of measuring Young's modulus by the slope. You try to do that on a piece of aluminum and you have 15 st students do it, you'll get numbers between 7 and 15 million pounds per square inch and the real number is 10 million, okay? Because of slippage in the grips and things like that, okay? So it's not that easy to measure Young's modulus unless you do it by frequency, okay? In fact, they, in steel mills, they have a little machines. You take a little strip of, of steel that you cut out and you, you slip it into this machine and it measures the speed of sound in that steel in a particular direction. Uh, so you have a sheet, a great big sheet of steel, and you cut out a specimen longitudinally you cut out a specimen transverse, and you cut out a specimen at 45 degrees, and you measure the speed of sound in each three of those numbers, and that modulus will be different in each three directions because of the texture of the crystals in the steel, and that steel will draw differently when you try to make a, a soup can or something like that out of it, okay? You can predict the drawability of an autom automobile body based on the speed of sound which is related to the Young's modulus and the stiffness of that. Um, it's called a module R machine. And we, if you take my deformation module, I'll go through it. Okay. But in any case, so here's a plot. And the stiffest material is diamond, 60 million. And down here are the metals. And steel is one of the stiffest metals, although tungsten alloys are, are higher than steels. But the highest is diamond at about 60 million. million. Here's a composite tungsten carbide plus cobalt. It's really the tungsten carbide. Um, we like to use car tungsten carbide as a structural material that's stiff for lots of things. But the problem is, anybody know the problem with tungsten carbide and why we don't use it more often? It costs $10,000 a pound. <laughs> okay, To form tungsten car carbide, you have to have furnaces that go to 20, well above 2,000 C. 2600 degrees C in some cases. So this happens to be a tool bit that we cut apart. It would have looked like this. And this is a tool, you would have several hundreds of these on a machine. Have you ever been driving on the highway late at night on an interstate highway and they're reclaiming the asphalt? They have a great big machine. This is the tool that's on that wheel that's beating up the asphalt and throwing it back into a, a trailer to be uh, recycled. Um, and you can wear out these tools in three or four hours, in which case you have to stop that machine, the mechanic has to go in. You're doing all this in the middle of the night. You're paying people double time to work in the middle of the night on the highway because you don't want to disrupt the traffic. You'd like to have something that lasts for a good eight-hour shift, okay? A lot of wear on that. It turns out, if you look at the details, this one's been polished better than the other one. I'll pass this around in a second. But if you look at the tip of this particular one, so there's some, there was a company, let's see if we can, yeah, okay. There was a company out, I think it was out in Utah, but anyway, uh, there's a lot of people out in Utah who liked to work on diamond because there was a guy, General Electric, Tracy Hall in the 1950s who developed the ways to make man-made diamond when he was at General Electric Research. But this actually is the tungsten carbide tip. From here all the way up here is tungsten carbide. It looks sort of copper colored, but I'll tell you the reason for that. This is actually centered diamond. Ordinarily the tip of this thing would just be tungsten carbide and it would wear out in three or four hours. If you, may, if you could make centered diamond tips on these things, they'll last more than eight hours, okay? Because you got more wear because of the stronger material. So I'll pass around, and I won't get into, they did step brazing and other things. Um, I was asked to help evaluate it because one company wanted to know if they wanted to buy this company, and we, I think they finally decided it was a great product, technologically superior, but it costs too much. So they didn't buy the company. At least that's what I heard at the last. Anyway, <clears throat> but so diamond is right at the top, and that's what they were able to put in there as a wear resistant hard structural material because tungsten carbide, which was almost as good, 
would, would have half or one-fifth the life of the diamond, okay? So small differences can make big differences when you get to things. Um, this is for stiff materials. Now, what else? I had something else here for stiff materials. Oh, yeah, I had the rongeurs. So once upon a time, back in the 1980s, so this is 30 years ago, I used to do a lot of consulting for a firm down south of Boston. It's been around since the 1830s. It's now a division of Johnson & Johnson that makes medical instruments. Does anyone know what a rongeur is? I never knew what it was. It's French, it's a word. A rongeur is basically a pair of pliers that a, a orthopedic surgeon would use to chew up bone, to break up bone. So this is a rongeur just a pair of pliers, and it has a little cupped in, so you can go in there and just bite away the bone. So they're gonna do, they're gonna fuse someone's spine or something, they go in there and he chips away at the bone, removes the bone that he wants to remove. Well, when people were doing, and it's not just bone, um, when they wanna do arthroscopic knee surgery, which was somewhat new, I have torn cartilages in both my knees now, but I had one of them since the 1960s uh, when I got injured in a football game, um, and that's in my left knee is the torn cartilage. Well, they can go in at that time in the 1960s to, replay, to remove that torn cartilage. You, they would have to lay open your whole knee, and you would be in a cast and on crutches for up to six months. Nowadays, you can go in and you can walk out of the hospital that day. You might have crutches for a week or something, but basically, they go in with microsurgery. They just put a little, rather opening up your whole knee. Um, they can go in with micro tools. They put a little slit in there and with a little fiber optic so that the surgeon can see what all the blood and guts looks like in there and try to see what he wants to cut up. He can go in there and he can use a little rongeur to eat away and pull out the cartilage and remove the cartilage that way. Minimally invasive surgery. Um, this is one of the first big applications. The rongeur for that application looked like this, and it's basically a pair of pliers, but it's got it's a sliding mechanism, and the, the cutting end is down here. So you have a little post sticking up, and this top slide slides above, and you go in there and just eat away the bone or the cartilage. Okay, that's the rongeur. Well, they try to get smaller and smaller in their tools. And you can see, I got, a, I got a stiffness problem here, right? And they were making them out of steel. Steel's 30 million. And they came to me and said, well, what can we make it out of that would be stiffer? Well, you can go to geometry. You can go to a tubular section, except they were trying to get them smaller and smaller. And tubular sections are larger. So I suggested, they never liked my suggestion. I loved my suggestion, that they consider what else there, first of all, there are not a lot of choices. I didn't have an Ashby plot back in 1982, whenever they asked me this question or whatever. But I knew the properties of materials, and I knew my choices were diamond, and I didn't know where I could get a nice, long, slender diamond like that, okay? But it would be a great tool, okay? Might be pricey, but this is a medical instrument, so you can charge a lot for it. Silicon carbide, I didn't know how I could get any reasonable cost silicon carbide. But I, if you look in this area at the top, there's alumina. What's another name for aluminum oxide? Sapphire. Here's a piece of sapphire. I'll pass it around. We can grow sapphire. This type of piece of sapphire was not single crystal. It was grown in a bool that was about the size of a great big beach ball. It took about a month to grow it in the furnace. You put the aluminum oxide powder in a furnace, you take it up to the melting point, which is above 2,000 degrees centigrade, about somewhere between 2,000 and 2,100 centigrade for pure alumina, and you would cool it down very slowly over about three weeks to cool it back down to a low temperature like 1,000 degrees centigrade before you'd open up the, the chamber and everything. Um, it's a ceramic, it's aluminum oxide. Sapphire is another name for it. 
We could grow sapphire bulls like this. Now, a sapphire bull like that cost about $100,000. That was just a chunk. You can saw it into little, little substrates, and the reason they were making these is because every LED has an aluminum oxide sapphire substrate. Just like a silicon chip on a computer, you have an aluminum oxide sapphire substrate. Doesn't have to be single crystal because it just has to match the coefficient of thermal expansion closely of the gallium arsenide that's making the, the LED. Okay? So it's a big business now to make all these LEDs, and that's what this company was making all this stuff for. They were up here in New Hampshire. They were selling this technology. Who were they selling it to? China. China gave them like a, I don't know, $300 million order for a bunch of these furnaces. And now, guess who owns the LED uh, manufacturing market because they own the business of making the sapphire substrates? China. And they would slice them up on diamond saws because what's the only thing that's going to cut that? On the hardness scale, the old Mohs scale, which was a kind of what material would scratch another material, diamond was number 10 on the Mohs scale. What's number 9? These are empirical numbers. These are just is sapphire, okay? Sapphire would scratch anything but diamond. Now, silicon carbide will actually scratch sapphire, but silicon carbide is not a natural mineral. But on the Mohs scale, M-O-H-S, of natural minerals, and at the bottom is talc, okay? Talc is nice and soft. I think it's number two or something like that. And gypsum might be number four or something. But the, the mineralogists for 150 years have had this hardness scale Diamond was at the top, sapphire was number two, and I can't remember what number three was. We've come up with other things like silicon nitride and silicon carbide and boron nitride and stuff. Um, some of the silicon aluminum oxides we call silons, silicon aluminum oxygen, nitrogen. Okay, they, They're fairly strong. So in any case, I wanted to make it out of single crystal sapphire. Now, you have to understand part of the business here of medical instruments. Uh, this is just a pair of scissors that a surgeon might use to go in there and snip some part of the body or something, or cut suture or something. This, um, back in the 80s, was a $300 pair of scissors. Okay, it's probably six or 700 now. Um, it has, it's brazed on the surface with a cobalt alloy for excellent wear resistance and strength and maintains its sharpness. Um, this is the type of thing, once you buy this pair of scissors, you can send it back whenever it's dull and they will sharpen it for free and ship it back to you and clean it up. Gold-plated handles, so that you know this is one of the premium grades of, of stainless steel scissors, right? Um, but I used to help make stainless steel instruments like this. Every one of them's got a hardness indentation on it because they do 100% check on the heat treatment of the hardness, okay? So it's better than your Fisker's scissors. I don't mean to knock Fisker's, okay? We could take someone else, but this is a better scissor. Um, but physicians will pay a fortune for these things. And it turns out some physicians, like I can't remember what the instrument was, Dr. DeBakey, the famous heart surgeon, he liked a particular color, and so they would color the instruments the color he liked because it was just his favorite color of instrument. And there are some, some uh, if you go to the dentist's office, you'll sometimes see some of the dental tools will be color coded. Just you can go to Sears and buy tool, tools that are color coded for different size ratchets and you know wrenches and stuff nowadays. But color coding would have been great. Um, with sapphire, you could have added a little chromium to the melt. And uh, if you added uh, chromium to the melt, you would have made ruby. So you could sell ruby instruments to the surgeon. And I mean, you could charge a fortune for these things. I mean, well, I was using ruby instruments when I cut your leg open. Anyway, um, so the rongeur, I wanted to make a rongeur out of sapphire. And I was confident that you could buy, you can buy, there was a company, um, actually it was the predecessor company that was making that stuff. But it was a company that had started here in Cambridge, um, and they could grow single crystal sapphire tubes or rods or sheets 
they take this 2,000 degree melt and they just just slowly pull the stuff out, okay, of the melt, and grow things of different size. I actually have some silicon like that uh, in my office that Professor Ellie Sachs, who did one of the inventors of the name 3D printing and and stuff, he invented a company that since went bankrupt, but they used some carbon wires, carbon fiber wires, and they would lift a sheet of, of silica, a, more, a polycrystalline silica, silicon, for solar cells. I got some, they're, they're about three or four inches wide, and you just grow the silicon right out of the melt as a thin sheet. You didn't have to cut it with diamond or anything else. It's gonna take over the solar cell market 25 years ago. Problem is, if you look at it cross-eyed, it will fracture, okay? Silicon is extremely brittle material. To show you a brittle piece of silicon, this is a chunk of silicon single crystal grown by a Chikrowski process, and it's completely brittle fracture, just like that piece of sapphire. The easiest way to break it is just whack it with a hammer, okay, and it breaks. It takes a big hammer to whack the sapphire because it's pretty hard. Silicon's pretty hard, but um, as I pass this around, this is the Chikrowski surface. It's darker. It's got some silk. It's grown in a vacuum system, but it's still darker. It's oxidized a little bit. On this surface, you actually see some fracture patterns, which if you know anything about fracture surfaces, or if you do already know something, you might think that's a fatigue fracture because it has little what we call beach marks. In a brittle material like glass, we call those hackle marks, and they're not from fatigue, cyclical loading. It's just the way some, uh, some, material, some brittle materials, very brittle materials, fracture. Anyway, I wanted to use, for Young's modulus reasons, sapphire. And they never would believe me that you could buy this stuff. You can buy sapphire rod for $15. You can buy sapphire tube probably for $30 for a foot-long tube. And it's twice as stiff as steel. Okay, And I knew I could kind of put a solid rod and use a diamond to make a cutting tip on one end and I could do something to put a tip on the other end and I could basically make a rangeur of a tube sliding, uh, a rod sliding through a tube. Ah, they didn't like it. Okay, hey, what do you hire a consultant for if you're not gonna listen to them? Okay, so there's other things that you can look at in the Ashby type plots. Um, this is, anybody have a question about any of that? This is, yep. No, no, then they didn't like my idea. They thought, they thought sapphire would be too expensive. I thought selling sapphire and ruby, ruby instruments would have great marketing appeal. And for simple instruments, simple cutting tools, you wouldn't find a better material. It's right behind diamond on hardness, so the wear resistance of the cutting edge is fantastic, right? I, I, I could, and the, the toughness is better than a lot of these ceramics tools that they use for cutting edges and stuff, okay? Anyway, they didn't like the idea. They never would try it. And I didn't think, I mean, I know that if you're actually machining with diamond tools, this stuff, it's not that hard to machine, okay? Sapphire with diamond. You can make some very intricate shapes. You gotta be fairly simple, and you can't do 3D printing, you gotta do subtractive manufacturing, but no, I, you know, hey, they didn't like the idea, so it never, never went anywhere. Uh, and they never would tell me a reason why they didn't like it, okay? Uh, but they, what they said is, we want something that's stiffer. And I said, there's only a, you've only got a handful of choices. Look at the Ashby plot. We didn't have Ashby plots back then. But I said, there's only a few materials. It's just like for the National Aerospace Plane in the mid-80s, they wanted to develop the, the, the surface of the airplane coming back into the atmosphere. This was the National Aerospace Plane was supposed to be a supersonic transport that would actually get up into space and then come back down and it could be like two and a half hours between any two cities on the globe, okay? Because you'd be going at Mach 17 up there in space, okay? So all you had to do was make the boost into space, do your travel with no air around, come back through the air, land and it would be two and a half hours anywhere in the globe. And this was actually partly, 
they never said it, but it was also part of uh, Reagan's Star Wars initiative. Because if you could do that and put civilians up in space, you could put hardware up in space and weapons in space, right? But turns out if you look at that Mach 17 coming back into the atmosphere, the frictional heating will give you surface temperatures of 3,000 degrees Kelvin. So they had a great idea. Well, we'll make it out of copper and we'll, liquid hydrogen will be our fuel and we'll just cool the inside with liquid hydrogen. So <clears throat> this was a great idea. Okay, I don't know where they get these people in the Air Force to come up with these ideas, but, or some of the aerospace companies. So this was going to be copper skin. This was going to be 3,000 degrees centigrade air. And this was going to be liquid hydrogen. Okay? Anybody see a problem? And this, the thickness of the copper was going to be about eighth of an inch, three millimeters. Anybody see a problem? You don't have to worry about lightning strikes because you have a better chance of just blowing yourself up anyway. Here's the Space Shuttle Challenger all set to go, right? But this was, hey, you know how many billions of dollars the U.S. government spent researching how to make this work? Well, you might think it's sort of funny. I thought it was sort of funny until in 2002 or 2004 or so, I was on another National Research Council committee on aircraft propulsion for the U.S. Air Force. To, this was a committee and we were supposed to help advise the Air Force on what materials to use and designs to use for their $300 million a year the U.S. Air Force had over the next 20 years to develop better motors. And they, uh, they told us, they came in and, and gave us a non-classified presentation. The Air Force wanted a Mach 17 warhead to fly through the air, not through space, but through the air at Mach 17. And the reason was, this was before they killed Osama bin Laden, this was mid, you know, 2004, 2005. They actually had located Osama bin Laden. And they had 15 minutes to get the ordinance on site. Okay? But they couldn't, I mean, he was gone from that region, you know, he, within 15 minutes. But if they had had the right weapon on one of the aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf, they could have, if it went Mach 17, they could have had it on site and got blown him up if they had a Mach 17 weapon. Well, what's the fastest uh, aircraft we have right now? It's like Mach 2, Mach 2 and a half. You know, it's an F-15, F-16 or something like that. And they, you know, burn all this fuel. And their skin is getting hot, okay? Uh, we had Mach 6 or 7, the, the X, XR-71 Blackbird or whatever, you know, this titanium-skinned aircraft that flew at 100,000 feet to take pictures of Cuba and stuff. Or the U-2 spy plane that Gary Powers in the 62, you guys wouldn't remember that. But um, uh, Anyway, we built special aircraft, but we've never built anything close to Mach 17. So I knew, and I said, well, this isn't going to be man-rated. No, it wasn't going to be man-rated. It's sort of like a Mach 17 cruise missile. Great, okay. But they also had another goal. Their other goal is they wanted to fly, they wanted to be able to fly 25,000 miles without refueling. I said, why do you need that? They said, we've determined we will not be able to have bases anywhere except in the continental United States. Well, I'm not sure I realized that. I said, actually, I said, why do you need to fly 25,000 miles? Why can't you just fly 13,000 miles and get halfway, right? And they said, no, we want to be able to take off, do whatever we want to do, and come back 25,000 miles to get anywhere in the Earth and take off and land from the, same, you know, from the continental United States. And the fuel efficiency and the lightweight requirements and the Mach 17, the temperature requirements, they're just as ridiculous as the National Aerospace Plane, okay? And I actually brought in some plots and stuff and kind of showed them that, um, and they, they gave us plots that showed 6,000 degree temperatures, okay, from the frictional heating near the surface. And I used those to calculate just the radiation heat transfer to the surface. So we're not even talking boundary layers. You couldn't, you couldn't even, you know, leak out a little bit of <clears throat> nitrogen or something on the surface as, a boundary, as an insulating boundary, boundary layer. Because just by straight radiation, which goes through 
any gas boundary layer, you would be above the melting point of copper or anything else. It made no sense. And then they didn't worry about, they hadn't even started to consider the fact that if the top surface of the copper was at um, uh, 900 degrees centigrade, it melts at 1100 centigrade, and the bottom was at liquid nitrogen, there would actually be some thermal expansion differences and distortion and things like that. Somehow they were going to just design those away. Okay. Ooh, okay. <clears throat> and we pay people to come up with these ideas. Okay. Anyway, there are other parameters. This is Ashby strength, not modulus, but um, fracture strength um, or yield strength he has here um, versus density because if you have a minimum weight design for strong ties, but you remember before it was stiffness of strong ties or beams or plates. Now it's minimum weight design, uh, minimum, maximum strength from minimum weight. And here's the plot, and it doesn't change all that much, but it is slightly different if you were to compare these. And the, you'll get these on Stellar. Oops. Um, and you still got diamond at the top. You've just shifted these things a little bit. And at the bottom, or over here on the side, interestingly, in terms of light weight, some of the lightest weight to strength ratio materials are something called wood. Okay? Anyone heard of the spruce goose? Okay, what was the spruce, spruce goose? World's largest, airplane. world's largest airplane. Howard Hughes decided to build the world's largest airplane. He built one of them. Uh, it was in, on display for years in Los Angeles somewhere, but it's still, still there? Okay. No, it's, in it's in Oregon. Okay. Uh, is it at the Space Museum in Oregon? I've been there, but it wasn't there when I was there, but it must have been moved there in the last 10 years or something. Anyway, um, so I've never seen the spruce goose, but it's called the spruce goose because you built out of spruce. And if you look on here, I don't know if they have spruce. But ash, the strongest wood is ash. Where does ash grow? A lot of ash grows in Kentucky. And what do we build in Louisville, Kentucky? Baseball bats, Louisville Sluggers. And what are they made out of? Ash. Why? Because it's the strongest wood. Yeah? So, like, yep. What is, what is what's, what's the advantage of maple? The answer is I don't know. Okay. Uh, and it's not tangential. It's, it's a key question. That would be a good topic of baseball bats. Now, there's also metal baseball bats, which is a whole other topic. I do know something about that, but I won't talk about that right now. But ash is actually, if you look, well, here it is. It's the strongest. And we've got oak and pine, and he didn't put maple on here. But I guarantee you maple's up here near the top, too. So I suspect it might be an availability thing. In New England, if you were making bats, you might make them out of maple. In Kentucky, there's all kinds of ash trees in Kentucky, which is one of the reasons Louisville Slugger is in Louisville. Okay? I have toured Louisville Slugger plant. At the end, they give you a little one foot long baseball bat. Okay. It's very interesting, <clears throat> uh, and just in terms of how they rapidly machine bats and how they customize bats for certain players and stuff. Then there's fracture toughness against density. Fracture toughness is this thing that, that uh, Griffith came up with in the 1920s when he was researching the fracture of glass. And I talked about how brittle glass is. And this is where Griffith um, found out that things can be tough as well as strong. Um, the original strength person to measure strength was a guy named Galileo. And here's a picture of Galileo's test apparatus. Okay. There it is. He had a beam and he put a weight on it. And this is out of one of his notebooks. Okay. And so he started studying the strength of beams. And this is out of a book called The History of the Strength of Materials by uh, Timoshenko. Anybody ever heard of Timoshenko? What do you know about Timoshenko? I remember, I know I've heard the name. 
Yeah, well, you've heard the name because he was a professor at Stanford University. Um, and I think uh, if you look on the inside, I think he lived from 1878 to 1972. But he basically, I mean, he was almost 100. He was 94 years old when he passed away. That's down here in the bottom. But uh, Timoshenko was kind of Mr. Mechanics of Materials in the whole country. He wrote books all over the place. If you studied, if your grandfather studied mechanical engineering or materials in the first half of the 20th century, he would have been studying out of one of Temeshenko's books. So Stephen Temeshenko wrote this book on history of the strength of materials, and we'll probably go through that, some of that um, tomorrow or another day. But in any case, Galileo was interested uh, in strength of materials, and I can't remember, where was I? I was talking about, oh, fracture toughness. So we learned in the 1870s, actually even earlier, I'll give some more history tomorrow, or let, no, one, on Monday. Monday's the next day of lecture. Saturday, you can have off. Sunday, too. Take them both off. Um, anyway, um, I'll talk some more about that stuff. But fracture toughness is the energy of fracture. Galileo was looking at the strength of fracture, and Timoshenko knew about the strength of fracture. Timoshenko lived through the era from 1925 to the 1950 and 1975, where we really learned about the toughness of fracture, which actually is a much more interesting story than just the strength of fracture to me, because we still continue to learn about the tough need for toughness in materials. But to give you an example, well, yeah, I got a minute. If you take a brittle material, you'll see me doing this on the History Channel, okay? When I talk about the Titanic. But you can pull on the edge of this material, paper, with pounds of force. If I put a flaw in the material, which is what Griffith was looking at, flaws in glass, it takes ounces. I can lose 80 to 90% of my strength because of a flaw in a brittle material. Whereas if I have a ductile material, like rubber, that is toughness, I can pull on that piece of rubber, and all I do is I don't have a sharp notch, I blunt the notch. And so I get lots of deformation without fracture. And there's a tremendous difference in ductility of fracture versus brittle fracture, and we're going to talk about that stuff on Monday. Have a good weekend.